Um, well, hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Kate Fox, and I'm a um, contractor um, doing education exhibits with Smithsonian Gardens. And this is Cindy Brown. Um, Cindy Brown is the education and collections manager at Smithsonian Gardens. Um, and we're going to present on our newest educational project, which is Community of Gardens, the crowdsourced digital archive. Um, we've been working on it for over a year now, so we are so excited to see it live and up. We thought, it really, we thought like we would never see the day. <laughs> um, also, feel free to interrupt me at um, any time if you have questions. This is a very small group, so um, and I'm not super formal. So um, I just wanted to show you a little bit about us. Um, Smithsonian Gardens, we're one of the smaller units at the Smithsonian, but we manage. Um, basically all of the grounds at all of the museums. Um, we, um, almost every museum has a garden. Um, so most of our staff are horticulturists. Um, they make all the beautiful flowers bloom that are outside right now. They do a wonderful job. Uh, we also um, manage the archives of American Gardens, um, which is a photographic archive dating back to probably the earliest images we have are mid-19th century of American gardens, photographs, landscape architecture plans, um, personal papers um, related to companies like Furby. Um, so some really, really amazing collections. And um, Cindy and I are part of the small collections and education team. Um, uh, Cindy oversees um, the archives of American gardens, and she also oversees all of the educational efforts that we do. Um, we do tours. We accommodate school groups. Uh, we collaborate with other museums. But um, we are really excited about our newest initiative, um, Community of Gardens. So uh, Cindy approached me about um, almost two years ago about this project. She had written a grant to set up a website to collect stories from the public about their own gardens. And um, this sort of came about because we, so we manage the archives of American Gardens, and I'll bring that up here. Um, this is a research collection, and it was um, started by a donation of slides from the Garden Club of America. And these were slides from the 1920s and 30s that were used to give lectures about um, famous gardens. And most of the slides are of these beautiful, lush estate gardens. Um, we're talking the 1% here that um, many don't exist anymore. This is the only evidence that they ever existed. Um, and um, you know, gardens come and go. Um, they're ephemeral. People um, tear them down. They change them. And so these are really the records, the only records of some of these gardens. Um, but one of the issues with our collection is that we really only tend to have the estate gardens, um, you know, thinking of like you know, the gardens out of Great Gatsby. Um, even um, though we have um, a group on the ground working with us from the Garden Club of America to continue document gardens for the archive, um, it's really just showing a small slice of America. Um, it's really, um, you know, the very beautiful manicured gardens that you could see in Better Homes and Gardens. And so, we really, Cindy really felt like the um, whole story about gardening in America was not being shared. Um, and that, you know, where are, where were the community gardens? Where are the, you know, the person who lives in an apartment, so they have a bunch of pots on their fire escape. Um, you know, where are the urban gardens? Um, where is just like your regular backyard with just a lawn? I mean, that's part of the story too. Um, so when we started talking about it, um, we were looking at um, a variety of different projects that um, use crowdsourcing. Um, you know, we were really excited to see what direction this would go in um, and how to promote it. And um, so, you know, I think this is becoming more popular with museums, reaching out to the public. Um, you know, I think obviously curators are still out on the ground, um, you know, meeting people and collecting objects. But um, this is a great way to capture those stories by having the public come to us, and it's also a way to engage with them about gardens. I think. We saw this as not just collecting historic material for our archive, but starting a conversation with people about what what do gardens mean to you? What role does gardening play in your life right now? Um, how do gardens make your community a healthier place or a better place to live? Um, and so, um, you know, some of the issues that we talked about were, you know, what kind of quality of stories will we get? Um, Will the images be, um, you know, large enough file size to be archival? And I think we just decided that we were just going to see how it goes. This is an experiment, and you know, when you're interfacing with the public over the internet, it's you, you just have to know that some things are out of your control. Um, so we worked with a we we searched around for a couple different options, and um, also Smithsonian Gardens. We have a very small budget, um, like like many units, and this is partially funded by a youth access grant. 
Um, because what one thing we're really interested in is training students to go out into their own community and collect stories about gardens, which you are doing right now with a public school in DC. They are um, ninth and tenth grade students interviewing people in their lives who are gardeners or um, have had a garden before, um, and they are collecting stories for the website. Um, and so the students are learning about their own family members and the role that garden plays in their lives as well. Um, so small budget, um, we looked at a couple places. We looked at um, Roundware, which is the um, developer, the wonderful developer that um, uh, Stories from Main Street uses. And for us, um, it wasn't quite a good fit because even though the app offered everything, um, it was really important for us to have a website and an app that kind of shared the same database seamlessly. And it was also going to be um, give us the kind of sort of metadata um, that we need. Um, we worked really closely with our museum specialists or the archi archivists at Archives of American Gardens and said, okay, you know, bare minimum, like what information has to be attached to these records and these stories that come in? And they kind of gave us a list and, you know, we talked with them a lot about it. And so we kind of kept looking at different companies. We looked at um, Night Kitchen Interactive and it doesn't seem to be coming up correctly, but they created this website called Fill a Place for, um, uh, for I believe the Historical Society, Pennsylvania Historical Society, yeah. And um, this is what kind of like what we wanted, you know, there, you can't see it, but there's a map of Philadelphia <laughs> and um, there's pins on it and these pins have been placed by the Historical Society or users can also share their own story and we wanted something that would be very similar to this. Um, so we contacted them and it was way out of our budget. They were lovely. We loved the project. It just did not fit in the scope of our budget. So we kept looking. Uh, and then we came across uh, CurateScape. And CurateScape is a company that runs out of Cleveland State University um, in their digital humanities department. And we um, contacted them, uh, Mark DeVoe and Mark Souther um, and Aaron Bell of um, the digital humanities department and told them about our project. And we were really interested because they've done, they've created essentially a, um, um, a location-based platform for Omeka. Um, and we love the idea of using Omeka because it, um, it's open source, it's free, it's stable. Lots of museums use it. Um, other units at the Smithsonian are using it. It's customizable. And I think most importantly, it's pretty user-friendly. And we do not have anyone um, we do not have a web developer on staff. We work with a contractor. Um, so it was really important to us that we be able to maintain this website on our own with a bare, um, bare minimum of money spent. And so some of the websites that they've done have mostly been for historical societies. And um, they're pretty basic. This is a basic out-of-the-box CurateScape website. Um, you know, they kind of have a... Um, you know, graphic elements that they've designed. Um, you click on the pins on the map and a story that has been submitted by the Historical Society will show up um, with photos and videos and text. Um, and so we were really interested in this, but the big element for us that was missing was that we also wanted people to add their own stories. And when I contacted them, I think they emailed back in like within five minutes and they were like, yes, we are so excited to work with the Smithsonian. And by the way, we've been wanting to add that feature to our websites for a long time. We would love to work with this, um, you on this. And so we ended up working with them as for, um, and a nice thing too is that their package comes with a mobile app. And they are currently working on um, uh, releasing a new version and we are expecting to hopefully have our mobile app in the App Store by August or September. And this is what it looks like, it's pretty simple. Um, there are just um, pins on the map, and you can click on the pin, and it will bring up um, text and images. Um, you know, it's great if you wanted to do like a self-guided, you know, walking tour of a city. Um, so ours will be a little bit na different, and then it will be national, um, and it will be gardens that are featured. Um, so this is the website we ended up with. We we knew that we needed to give it the Smithsonian Gardens look. Um, so we have a wonderful contractor named Brian Kordiak that we work with for our Smithsonian Gardens website. And he um, teamed up with the team at CurateScape to really completely customize the look and feel of the website. So it's still, it's still Omeka. It's still basically the CurateScape platform. Um, but he really gave it the Smithsonian Gardens look. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty simple website. Uh, we've got a map of the U.S. 
and you can click on the pins to explore different gardens. Um, one of the issues that came up was that we are really interested in collecting stories about um, private gardens, people's own backyards, and obviously they do not want everyone in the world knowing their home address. And so um, we weren't sure if that was going to be um, you know, a deal breaker with the CurateScape platform. So Brian um, Kordiak worked with them to develop a way to differentiate public and private gardens. And so private gardens are orange, public gardens are green, and what happens is when you zoom in to the local level, like the city level, um, you'll see that the pins disappear. Um, and so at the zoom level that says private gardens are not shown um, to protect people's privacy. And we actually don't even ask for the home address of the gardens. We really just ask people to put down, you know, uh, Bloomingdale, Washington, D.C. Um, we don't, we aren't collecting that information. Um, we just don't want the pins to appear on the map so it looks like they're in a false location. Um, so that was a really nice fix. Um, we have a featured garden. We can, um, it's really easy for me to manage. Um, I can choose different gardens to feature. Um, and this is a great story. This was submitted by a man in Virginia um, who heard about us through, I think, a uh, listserv. And he submitted this wonderful story about um, his family's garden history going back to the 19th century. His uh, great-grandfather was an Italian immigrant, and um, he submitted all of these really just like wonderful um, family photographs of um, his grandfather um, in his garden and his father um, and his children as well um, in um, their garden. So this is like really excited to get this story. This is just wonderfully written. It was one of you know, just what we're looking for. Um, the other thing you can do besides Spore, Spore Gardens, you can share a story. Um, let's see. I'll log in here. Um, it's built into Omeka, and the whole site is um, in um, SSL. Encrypted because we have we do have a login. Yeah, just just in community of gardens. I can remember a password. <laughs> it's really long. We just changed it. Um, Okay, great. So this is what you would see if you were going to submit a story about your garden. Um, it's pretty basic. You enter the name of your garden. Uh, you can type in your text or cut and paste here. Um, we are anticipating um, you know, a lot of nonprofits or community gardens submitting stories. So you can, um, if it's a public garden, you can add your organization website here so people can find out more about the garden. Um, the one issue I've had with this is that um, Gardeners are very proud of their work, and um, they are so excited to share it with the world. And one issue that has come up was with people really wanting to link back to their personal blogs and their Facebook pages. And um, I just, you know, thinking it's important um, not to feel like we are like endorsing or advertising somebody's product or, um, you know, um, personal Facebook page. And so. That has been tricky to kind of negotiate that with the garden owners being like, oh, I'd love to share it. I'll let you know if that changes. Like, but for now, like we can't really link to that. This is this is more. We tried to clarify with our language here, but it's really more for, you know, if you, you know, this is a um, city blossoms in Washington, DC. And they maintain um, gardens all over the city and they also um, have programs for school kids. And so you want to find out more about them. You go to their website. Um, so that's been kind of tricky because um, I know people really want to um, gardeners love to share their work. Um, you can upload files. Right now we are hosted on DreamHost, but we are currently switching over to the Smithsonian server, which will give us a little bit um, more leeway in terms of how big the files can be. Right now we can take up to 10 images um, from uh, gardens, um, files up to 7 megabytes. Um, I, I have noticed that some people have had problems when they're uploading lots of large images. Um, so, you know, that's kind of one technical issue we hope to resolve when we change the server. Um, you can add the location of your garden. 
you agree to the legal terms that we drafted with um, general counsel. Um, we also um, have a parental permission slip. Um, so if teachers are submitting the work of their students, um, um, for those students' work to be online, um, we had to draft a permission slip with um, a general counsel for the parents to sign. And we were a little bit nervous about that at first because we thought that would be like just too many steps. Um, but I think, you know, I think that when you explain to the students, like, in the context of, like, you know, you're contributing real original research to the Smithsonian, you know, and this is one of the steps that you have to go through, I mean, I think um, that, you know, that kind of helps mediate that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just click and go. But, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, it's obviously privacy is important, and we want to make sure we're in line with all of the Smithsonian uh, regulations. Yeah, so with, um, as I understand, there are um, much stricter privacy laws that came in place last year with um, minors and internet use. And, you know, we had looked at some other Smithsonian sites that say 13. And we said, oh, well, 13, that's great. Like, we think we're going to be working with high school students anyways. And I think the feeling with um, Cindy Zarate, and I had a lot of conversations about this, she's a privacy officer, was that, um, and also um, Aaron and general counsel, was that really, if you are under the 18, age of 18, you really can't give consent. Um, so in a way, if you're over, even if you're over the age of 13, it's not really totally legally binding because you're, you're not um, an adult. And so that um, we are really, I think at the Smithsonian, they're really encouraging sites to move over to sort of an 18 and older. Um, I'm not sure what Curious does. I was actually curious about that. <laughs> um, I haven't had a chance to check out um, their website as much because I know that they have a section where um, students can create field journals. I think the biggest thing for us was that um, their um, their work is going to be public, like be able to be viewed by the public, and there can potentially be images of students like in their school garden, um, and just knowing that the parents understand this and are giving their full consent to it. Um, we also have a Tumblr where we're kind of documenting um, some of our school programs. Uh, we will be putting up in the coming months some educational plans. Um, let's see if I can show you some of the gardens. Um, we can, so we can also do video and the Anacostia Community Museum has done a great series of um, uh, interviews as part of their Garden Stories project. And we have put up a couple clips from their videos. Let's see which one is that. Here we go. Great. So right now, we can only host like a minute and a half clips. But I think that's OK. I think people have a short attention span. I mean, I, I would like to go up to three or four minutes, um, which we might be able to do on the Smithsonian server. Hi, my name is Gail. I live in... Oh, you guys probably, you probably can't hear that. Can you can you hear the yeah. audio? OK. Northwest DC and Network. I've been living in DC since 1999. And right now, I'm the owner of Three Part Harmony Farm. It's a mostly vegetable farm in Northwest DC. I grow on five or six different plots around my house. Um, I like to grow a lot of different kinds of vegetables have a lot of variety. That way, in case one thing doesn't go right, then I have a backup. I also like to introduce people to new vegetables that they maybe never heard of. And So that's just a quick sample. This is one of the interviews from Anacostia. Um, I love that we can have video. I think it's just great. Um, we haven't gotten anyone to submit videos yet, but we are working with the students and um, at Paul Public Charter School, and we hope that some of them choose to do video um, as part of their Community of Gardens project. Um, do you have questions for me at all so far? Okay. How many, uh, how big is the response then? So when did you post this? The website went live, I think, about March 15th, and we did not start advertising until probably the first week of April um, for National, um, for uh, National Public Gardens Month. National or Garden. National Garden Month, yeah. And so um, it's been pretty, we've had about, I think, um, 1,600 hits on the website. Um, we have, I have gotten about, um, I've had about seven people submit stories to the website, just unsolicited, not someone we reached out to. 
Um, you know, I think um, I think with this project too is we I think as a smaller unit we don't have a lot of visibility, and I think what we're realizing now is that um, I think a lot of the, our submissions are going to come from people that we are reaching out to individually, and I think. Um, you know, getting also other gardening organizations to help us promote. We um, are, I think, Lewis Ginter is a botanical garden in Richmond, Virginia, and they are really interested in, you know, putting this on their social media and maybe doing a blog post about it. So we're hoping that we can kind of team up with, um, in the future, we're really hoping that we can team up with other museums or affiliates across the country and get them excited in training their students or volunteers or members to go out and collect or submit these stories. Um, so but I think I'm pretty happy with it so far. Like we've gotten um, one interesting thing about crowdsourcing, like you just don't know what you're going to get. And we've gotten a real um, variety of quality of stories. I had a, just a lovely story that came in yesterday um, about a woman who was reminiscing about her, her mother's garden. And just incredibly detailed with plant names and just wonderful. And I just, you know, I fixed like one thing before it went live. Then I've had other people just submit like um, three or four sentences. And so, um, you know, I think sometimes it's, it's really involved a lot of time on my part going back and forth with that person. And people have been really receptive. And what I normally do is I write them back and I say, thank you for submitting your story to our archive. Like, you know, you talked about how you built this garden out of this discarded box. I'm really interested in that. Recycling in gardens is such a big thing now. Could you please tell us more? And so I'll work with the person to see if I can get some more information from them to add to their response um, and also get some more images. Um, we did debate on requiring an image to submit your story, but then we didn't really want to leave out people who are maybe like reflecting on, yeah, their, their mother's garden and they have no images, or their grandmother's victory garden. Um, but when people are writing about their garden as it is today, um, I do encourage them to send in a picture if possible. Um, you know, we get a lot of iPhone pictures, which are not, you know, they're not archival quality, but like I keep thinking it's better to have them than to not have them. Um, I mean, these are the everyday stories, you know. Um, if I think about it too, that, you know, the pictures from the 1950s of everyday backyards are, you know, brownie camera pictures, which are not great quality, but it's still, it's better to have them than not have them. Um, so we still kind of, you know, and we, um, I mean, it's always good to go into a project knowing what you're going to do with it, but I think we're okay. I think this is an experiment, um, you know, seeing, okay, how, how long can we sustain interest? Um, how long can we fund it? Um, we definitely anticipate it being up for at least five years. And then at the end, it will be really interesting to see how is this preserved. Um, probably as one object, um, not as individual objects. We don't anticipate cataloging them as individual gardens into the archives of American gardens. But we also didn't want to move too quickly into that because once something becomes um, an object in a collection, it we are sort of bound to care for it for a very long time in a certain way, and um, we don't want to create a complicated situation um, before we even know what we have to work with, I guess. Um, but we do hope to preserve this in some form, and we still have ongoing conversations with our um, archival staff about that. And Richard. Yeah, yeah. No, we haven't gotten anything negative. I think um, we have had a couple people with technical problems who are disappointed. Um, and so I think one man ultimately decided not to submit his story. Um, you know, and I think running an SSL makes the site a little slower than we would like it to be, but we just couldn't get out of doing it. Um, and, you know, and it means better that way because it's, it's more secure. Um, but we haven't gotten anything negative. I got a couple people who just submitted, like, this is a test, um, but those are just easily deleted. Um, and we also anticipate with our mobile app, um, the thing about CurateScape is that the framework is only flexible to a certain point, which is, I think, what keeps the cost down. And so our mobile app will be a map, probably just featuring public gardens that you can visit. And then you can look at private gardens in a list view. And if you want to submit your story, you're not actually submitting it through the app. You press a button in the app, and that will take you to the mobile version of um, the website. And part of that, too, is I think that, I mean, we kind of wonder what is the audience for documenting a garden on your iPhone. It's a lot of typing. Um, though I could certainly see someone doing it on their iPad. Um, so we also anticipate, though, getting more submissions, I think, 
as we get a little bit more press through the, the Apple App Store. We're hoping to get onto their featured list because they, they like the Smithsonian, so. <laughs> Yeah, and I also wanted to show you the back end. It's really user friendly. I'm not a programmer. Um, this is the Omeka back end that we log into. Um, new items pop up here. We have a specific email address for this project, and so whenever anyone submits a story or registers as a new user, um, I get an email. Um, and so what I and things don't go live. I mean, we have it set that. Um, after you submitted stories, says thank you for submitting your story. We will be in touch within three to five days um, and send you a link um, to your story. And so it is really, it would be nice to automate some of this, but um, you know, you still need that human touch. And it, it, the workflow is a bit of um, time on my part, um, but I think it's worth it. And uh, so we, it shows that we have 31 gardens. Um, we have tags also. You can explore by tag on the website. Um, it lists all of the users as well. Um, it's really easy to go in and edit an item. Um, we're using Omeka pretty minimally. If this were a museum collection, there are tons of uh, metadata fields that you can use. Um, we're really just using title and description um, for our stories. Um, files, tags. Map, so it's really yeah, it's really just really easy for me to go in and um, just we're not really heavily editing. Um, we want people to retain their voice, so really just obvious spelling errors or grammar errors. Um, you know, if things need to be italicized, I will fix that as well. Um, and then um, once I feel like the story is ready, I can um, tag it as public or if it's a great story featured. Um, and it will go live on the website. And then um, I will email the person back, and I have sort of a form that I cut and paste and put the link into their story as well. So it's very, very easy to manage. Um, let's see. I think, um, I think we learned a lot from this project. It took us a lot longer <laughs> than we anticipated. Um, I, in some ways, we're both sort of new to the Smithsonian systems. And um, I think that. Um, just getting the contract through with CurateScape and then working with OCIO to get the website approved. Um, it was a really long process. And everyone we worked with was so wonderful. General counsel, the privacy officer, OCIO, everyone was super helpful. But I think what I, what I took away from this is that I think more and more small units are going to do projects like these, whether or not it's crowdsourced or not, um, just small websites for um, different educational projects. And, there's not really a guide to this. You know, I, we totally did not go through the correct processes. In the end, we did, but we were filling out forms like after the fact because we didn't know who to talk to. We didn't know who to ask. We were told one thing by this person and one thing by that person. And so um, I would like to see in the future sort of like a dummies guide to like how to create a, like a website at the Smithsonian. I just think, you know, step one, talk to this person at OCIO. Step two, fill out your project management plan. Step two, you know, um, in the end, we got it all in, but um, it certainly um, wasn't going through the whole technical review process. I mean, uh, they felt very comfortable with the website, um, and it's secure and, you know, it going live, but um, we did things out of order, and I think um, there is going to be a real need for that, because it is really not a user-friendly experience. Um, you know, and um, a lot of departments don't have a webmaster um, to negotiate this with you. So someday I would like to see something like that. I think, too, what keeps going on, too, that we found out from educators, we were not web people. It takes a lot more knowledgeable than I am. I'm, I, you know, I'm waiting on it. But it would be much easier for an education-driven project if one of those outlines existed, because then we would know who to go to talk to. We don't have our webmaster at work is, is a museum specialist. 
she's not a she's not a webmaster really. So it would be much easier. You, you come to these these mobile meetup things and realize most of you are web people. It would be much easier if there was a guide for educators because then the educator would know what was possible and could better speak to the project to the web designer. Um. Yeah, I think that's. A, I mean, I think that's a good way of putting it. I think you know. I mean, we were lucky that we worked with a contractor who can translate a lot of this for us. But um, you know, I think there's definitely a room at the Smithsonian to like, streamline um, that process, whether it's in the mobile department or with OCIO. Um, so this is just this is just one of the stories um, that we got. Betty's garden, um, who is sort of reflecting on the role that gardening plays in her life, and. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting about this project is I love that it's looser than a traditional archive. With the Archives of American Gardens, it's a very, very long process where all the images have to be slides, high-quality DSLR. There's, um, you have to have a plan of your garden. There's um, tons of paperwork to fill out. And this is really nice because I feel like um, it might not be the complete story, um, but it's, I think it's a really nice pulse on sort of what gardening means to people. And I think it's just a really nice to see these things in context with each, with each other, which is why I love the map that, you know, you can see the similarities and the differences in different regions of the country, um, and you're kind of traveling on the same map through time periods and through different people's voices. And, um, you know, we're really excited to have students collect stories, but we're also really excited to see how teachers might use this in the future. Um, you know, we're working with a few different teachers developing curriculum, um, but we, you know, are really excited to get some feedback to hear how teachers are using the stories on this website um, as part of their teaching. So that's another side of it. Does anyone have questions at all? Regarding the promotion, mm -hmm. it's already happening that uh, when the app will come out, how are you going to market the app and the website together? How, what are the channels you already said? Gardening Association and mm -hmm. also how the people that visit the museum will know about the app. What, what are your channels? Your social media or yeah, those are good questions. We're still developing that. Um, we are lucky that, well, we had a Smithsonian Magazine article come out recently because we're really lucky because Beth Pye Lieberman loves gardens and she's very nice to us. And um, a great article came out by Kathy Jentz, who is the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine. Um, and I think that definitely got us some press. Um, we also, Jessica Sedek at um, uh, the sort of uh, PR team has been really wonderful about pushing out information about community of gardens. So I think um, when the mobile app launches, um, I put together a marketing guide that I actually based off of sites. Someone at sites put together a wonderful marketing guide for their um, Romare Bearden app. And um, I was sort of working off of how they promoted um, their app because it's been very successful. And so I think we're going to do a big Twitter, um, Facebook, Pinterest, social media rollout. Um, we're going to be creating um, cards with QR codes that we can hand out at various events that we do. Um, you know, I would love to see some signage in the gardens, but that's always um, sort of a tug of war um, to get that kind of signage. So um, I think at least if we are getting our Twitter handle um, you know, on our signs in the garden and our website, that will hopefully lead people um, to us. Um, right now, we don't have separate social media accounts for community gardens. Um, I manage our social media accounts, and so I think I can only manage one at a time. So <laughs> we're just sharing the account. But I have set up a Facebook page for Community Gardens, just in case we do want to use it someday. Um, again, reaching out to um, different like listservs in this area, wanting to be really strong in DC, Maryland, Virginia gardens. Um, reaching out to our contacts at other museums. Um, we really would love to work with affiliates to um, be able to promote this um, project um, across the country. Um, and then also, you know, hoping to get some of the, um, build some excitement for the project through the Apple Store as well. Yeah. I think the working with other museums and other public gardens is going to be a big part yeah. of it. Because like Kate said, this, these are very personal stories. And if you're working with the person, you can get the stories out there. So as we work with the affiliates and the other public gardens, I, I think that's going to drive it. Yeah, and I think we, we are lucky that we've, um, 
uh, kind of reached out to some public gardens, and everyone has been so receptive of the idea, just so interested, and you know, really wants to tell their volunteers about it. And so, you know, that's really our audience. I think we're going also for um, you know quality over quantity, and I think it's those really passionate gardeners that are going to um, craft really um, interesting and engaging stories, um, as well as the students who are going out um, and interviewing people in their communities. Yeah. Um, and one thing we haven't really delved into that I would like to collect stories of, but it might complicate the website too much, is um, stories of Americans gardening abroad. Um, so I have a friend who was stationed in Baghdad as part of the Foreign Service, and she told me about this amazing community garden that she and some of the other Americans were running, along with all of the nationalities that were living in the green zone. So I would love to have that story, but I don't want to um, confuse people using the website. But I think that's another intriguing direction, a different kind of story that we could collect. Um, as well. And this really is our first foray into doing online applications for the bigger archives too. So, you know, it's this is a whole new world for us. And just being able to see how the how to gather information, have these conversations and then what would it take to ask for higher resolution pictures and what would it take mm -hmm. to to have online applications. Yeah, like we would love to see this as like a starting point for thinking about how we could develop an online submission form for the Archives of American Gardens um, and how how can we um, collect and manage that digital data. So with three people. Yeah, so three people. So it's, it's a bigger question. So um, but this is like our first, um, you know, this is a, we're starting small here. <laughs> Any questions online? Have you guys tried this with, or something like this, gathering stories, photos, then you do? Um, it's, we, so our office runs the badging program. Um, so we do mm -hmm. a lot with. Uh, yeah. 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 So people can go up there. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can see you. They can see the screen. Yeah. They can hear you. <laughs> I made sure to ask if I was going to be on film for all okay? time. <laughs> I was just I was just saying, um, Skilda Center for Learning and Digital Access. Uh, we run the badging program, and so we have a lot of similar issues. Um, one of the reasons why I'm asking about mm -hmm. ages because that's what we have to deal with a lot. Um, but we also do photo submissions and um, a lot of uh, student work submissions. Um, so. Uh, we have had a lot of issues with that, um, mm -hmm. a lot of similar issues. Um, we have had scale issues too. So mm -hmm. if we get too many submissions, you know how to, which how isn't something, that? which isn't something you have to deal with right now. Yeah. But in the future, you yeah. know, people are submitting a lot of stuff. I, I'm, I'm surprised that you take video submissions via email because that could get out of hand quickly too. Yeah, I <laughs> um, think, I think the thought was that we're going to see how it goes, and we haven't gotten any yet. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, our, luckily, we do have web developer on staff, mm -hmm. um, and so we've been we put out an RFP to get a uh, custom robust system put into place. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's that's a struggle too because then we're contracting for them to build things like this that already exist yeah. in some in some sense. So, mm -hmm. but I I think your site looks beautiful. So thank that's you. Very useful. Yeah, and I think it's I mean it's good to have. I, that's what I love about this forum is that you know it's it's a good place to discuss these issues that do come up. You know, and um, you know I think it's um, we love the website, and I think the one struggle is we don't have yeah we don't have a web developer on staff, and so like we actually have a like we have a um, a license with CurateScape that needs to be renewed every two years, and it's not expensive, and it really gives us um, I mean. A ton of um, technical support from them. It's pretty amazing, um, but you know it does, um, in some ways, put that out of our hands. If we, you know, want to continue this, we always have to kind of look for more funding. Um, yeah, and also thinking about how um, to fall in line with the Smithsonian rules, but also not um, drive people away from the website by making things too complicated. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love to get um, one of the marks from CurateScape to 
address one of the mobile. They couldn't make it today, but they would love to at some other point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, how was the, the relation with the developer? Uh, because usually you hear lots of stories about the construction process that takes a lot of time. Yeah. It's not always um, more to into the developers and the projects they got in their actions. So, yeah, yeah. So it was. Um, I think the hardest part was just getting the contract. Um, I had never done a contract before, and so um, <laughs> I think some of the time it took was probably on my part, not really getting the process. Um, but um, yeah, it was a lot of back and forth to get that contract signed. And um, but once it was, I mean, they were ready to go. They are, have been so responsive, and I think in a lot of ways, if you think about the cost of the project, which is about. Um, 10,800 for the mobile app and the website um, is that we have really gotten a lot of technical support from them and they have really um, customized the website, which they knew going into it was part of the contract, but it's um, you know pretty amazing the amount of time that they have put in changing things and um, reworking things to, you know, if one solution didn't work, trying something else. So it's actually, they've been really wonderful to work with and um, they also work directly with um, uh, Brian, our web contractor, who, yeah, which has been really key, because he is sort of our intermediary, where if we don't understand something that they're talking about, Brian will say, okay, this is what they mean, um, and who also was giving it, you know, our graphic look, because we didn't really want it to look like an out-of-the-box, just another CurateScape website. Um, we wanted it to look like it was a Smithsonian project as well. Um, yeah, they've been really wonderful to work with, and I think also a big part of it is that they come from a digital humanities department, so they are academics and scholars who are really interested in forwarding the field of digital humanities and are interested in these issues that come up with a project. So I think instead of um, feeling frustrated, um, they see it as a challenge or something that would be interesting to discuss because they they are interested in these issues and um, you know they they are part of the field and they're um, coming from museum and university backgrounds. So I think that helped a lot um, you know for them understanding um, our perspective as well as opposed to maybe working with somebody who's like a game developer um, as well. But yeah, it was actually once the contract was signed, it's been a very smooth process since then. <laughs> That took a long time. like three months. <laughs> I really think Brian is key because he really, if, if we had, we thought of something, Kate could go to Brian and Brian said, oh yeah, okay, and he would go to the web. Yeah, it was great too because they are really um, uh, sort of more on the developing end and um, Brian was more on the visual end so like a lot of times he would be able to solve something um, with a really elegant visual solution so that was, um, that was great that they were kind of able to work together um, in that way and accommodate the different things that we were asking for for the website. I think it's also really good because we we wanted a really simple um, platform. A simple platform with very little that can go wrong. That is a beauty. If we wanted something with more bells and whistles, that would have been a problem. Yeah. But this suits us just perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's the stories that shine. It's the stories in the map. Yeah. Definitely, and we're, and we're hoping to. I think as people, um, gardens are actually blooming now that people will submit more stories. We had quite a few people said, oh, I want to um, submit the story of my garden, but like it's just brown right now. There's nothing growing. So I think um, as people head into the growing season, they'll be um, more attuned to taking pictures and uploading their stories. And um, yeah, it will be just be interesting, the volume of stories, because like, it is pretty time intensive. Um, you know, we want to share people's voice sort of, you know, we want to keep the stories in our voice, but at the same time is um, I want to make sure if somebody's visiting this website, maybe just to look at stories. They don't want to upload their own stories. I want the stories to be informative and engaging enough that they stay on the website and read them. And so, you know, a big part of that is, is making sure that the quality of stories is sort of up to um, our standards as well, which is a lot of back and forth between us. Um, I think as I understand it in American history at the Agriculture Archive, I think they have sort of a similar process where um, if need be, they ask people for more information or to clarify things or add things to their stories as well. Um, uh, we also seeded the story or seeded the website with 
um, stories from the archives of American Gardens as well. Um, we didn't want people to come across a blank website <laughs> uh, when we first launched, and so um, we have also added stories from our collection to hopefully inspire people and show them the types of stories that they can tell um, as well. And I think that's all I have. <laughs> um, I don't know, do, does anyone online have questions or if anyone's still? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for um, being here to learn about our project. Share your story. Yes, if you're a gardener, you should definitely share your story or pass it on to somebody who wants to share their story who is a gardener. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>